when something like this happens to you, I'm not going to lie to you and tell you I didn't keep hoping it would happen. <laughs> All the speeches that you've made up in your bedroom or in the bathtub <laughs> go out of your mind completely. <laughs> and you find that out of all the words in the world, just two stick in your mind. Thank you. Hi everyone and thank you for joining me. In this video I want to take a look at the Best Actress nominees of 1959. As usual I will tell you my personal opinion on each of the five nominated performances and at the end present you my choice for the Best Actress of the Year. Before we start, here are the nominees. Doris Day, Pillow Talk. Audrey Hepburn, The Nun Story. Catherine Hepburn, Suddenly Last Summer. Simone Signore, Room at the Top. And Elizabeth Taylor, For Suddenly Last Summer. This lineup might not be the most famous in the history of the Oscars, but it's definitely one of the most fascinating that this category has to offer. We see two legends at different moments in their careers, one continuing to prove her acting talents, hoping that her work on the screen will overshadow all the drama off the screen, and one showing her longevity and entering a new phase of her career. Then another legendary screen presence, also deepening the skills of her art and delivering maybe not one of her most iconic, but still most praised performances. And then we have the quintessential all-American box office star, also entering a new period of her stardom with the signature role of her career and the official recognition of her talents by the Academy. And finally we have the winner, an equally legendary actress from France whose big leap into English language productions was so unique and captivating that it overcame Hollywood's aversion to leading ladies outside of its comfort zone. In this way the best actress race of 1959 seems like a sequel to 55 when another giant from Europe made a big first hit in the US and won the award over four American stars, who also included Catherine Hepburn. Both women broke many stereotypes about what could and could not be presented on the screen and how they could and could not realize their characters simply by the force of their acting and personalities. All of this makes for a very exciting lineup, so let's get right to it with the first nominated performance. You sound like a real dummy to say, I'm an expert on anything, because you, you better be if you say that. You know? Well, as it happens, I do know rather a lot about humor and comedy, because I've studied it in addition to performing it. And in my capacity as some kind of a one-ninth of an expert, I can tell you that Doris Day is one of the very best comedy actresses of all time. She can also do serious drama when the occasion requires. But I say this, it, it's also like saying O.J. Simpson plays good football in a sense. He does. Like, yeah. <laughs> does good commercials too. Yeah. But my point is, Doris has had enormous success, but has very often not gotten the critical appreciation That's true. to which she's entitled. And she really is entitled to it. Well, I'm getting it now. <laughs> oh. There's a thing You're like 20 this. Now that's okay. That's sweet. Thank that's you, sweet. That's sweet. One of the biggest film stars of the 1950s and 60s, Doris Day reached a sensational peak in 1959. The most successful movie of her career, the signature role of her career, and on top of that, the only Oscar nomination of her career, which enabled her to carry the title Academy Award nominee for the rest of her life, similar to other one-time nominees such as Jean Arthur, Marlene Dietrich, Debbie Reynolds or Margaret Sullivan. The nomination was a long time coming and was also not guaranteed, but Doris Day's career as a movie star was still very smooth and successful, even if it was not what she had planned. Born Doris Koppelhoff, she aspired to be a dancer and at the age of 15 entered a dance contest which won her $500 plus a trip to a dancing school in Los Angeles. Unfortunately, Doris' dreams were shattered a few days before her trip when she was on the way to a farewell party and a train hit her car. It was a train wreck, yeah, and, you and, and I was in a car with three other people and um, we were uh, just going across the track. There were no, no lights, nothing, it was a small town mm -hmm. and it was winter, windows closed and the, the train came and took the whole front of the car off. Yikes. Do you remember it vividly? Vividly? Yeah. Oh. And you yeah. were really injured, I mean they didn't think you would... Uh, yeah, I was really laid walk. up about three years. The accident seriously injured her legs and destroyed her plans for the future. 
But during her recovery, Doris discovered another talent, singing. Her mother quickly recognized this too and soon Doris began to take professional singing lessons and took her first job at WLW Radio in Cincinnati. She was then hired for the Lee Brown Band and changed her name to Doris Day after her rendition of the song Day After Day. She later made a big hit with Sentimental Journey, a song that captured the feeling of the time after World War II and then made her movie debut in Romance on the Seas in 1948. She admitted that she had no acting experience to director Michael Curtiz, but he liked her audition and sensed that she had a natural talent for the screen and he was later very proud of having discovered Doris Day as an actress. The next decade was an ongoing stream of success for her. She mostly starred in musical comedies and perfected her image on the screen as the uncomplicated blonde sweetheart from next door. Do you have any control over something like that or did Hollywood just create that image and, and go with it? Someone created it. The fan magazines created it, I guess. Maybe the films I did created it. Well, you look like That's a, right. a wholesome yeah. Midwestern, yeah, you're Northern good. European type. You know? <laughs> I'm serious. I don't mean that to be funny. I mean, that's, that's America's idea of the girl next door. As a movie blonde, she filled a spot that her famous contemporaries left open. She wasn't cool like Grace Kelly or sexual like Marilyn Monroe. Doris Day was the essential American girl. Miss Sunshine, nice and proper, lovable and innocent. However, even if Doris Day is mostly known for her comedies and musicals opposite various famous male co-stars, she began to stretch her acting abilities in the middle of the 50s with more serious parts in Love Me or Leave Me and under the guidance of director Alfred Hitchcock in The Man Who Knew Too Much. But even with Hitchcock, music always remained a part of her on-screen personality. Ever will be, will be the future's not ours to see. Que sera, sera. When she reached the end of her 30s, a time when the careers of many actresses are already over, Doris Day reinvented herself. She remained in comedies, continued to sing catchy tunes, but it all became more adult, more chic, and with a good dose of sexual implications. Everything was left to the imagination. They were a little bit sexy. Yeah. The comedies with Rock Hudson and, and Jimmy Garner. That was very... Uh, when, when that pillow talk, for example, was made and you had the that that scene with the feet in, in bathtubs oh, and the feet were up footsies. against... Footsies. That was very footsies. daring, wasn't it? It was then. Now it's boring. <laughs> oh, yeah. I guess. I don't know. And of course, Pillow Talk also started the relationship of one of the most famous on-screen couples in Hollywood history. How many pictures did you do with Rock? Not as many as people think. Three? Three. But we somehow identified you two as being in much more than that. Oh, my darling. Oh, my darling. Are you having another nightmare? Uh, no, oh, I... I, I yeah. dear, with their three movies, Rock Hudson and Doris Day became their own Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn or William Powell and Myrna Loy. And Doris Day also became a more sophisticated, more grown-up and more sexy version of her former screen image, but still with a high level of innocence. Pauline Keel dismissively called her the all-American middle-aged girl, but audiences didn't care. The combined star power of Doris Day and Rock Hudson catapulted Pillow Talk in the top 5 of the year's most successful movies and gave both the careers a strong boost. Critics also liked Pillow Talk for what it was, even though they mostly focused on the unexpected comedic talents of Rock Hudson, stating, One of the big and most pleasant surprises of Pillow Talk is the genuine comedy talent displayed by Rock Hudson, whose popularity up to now has been gained in straight dramatic roles. Did, what was the first picture? The Pillow Talk. Pillow Talk was the first thing, that's right. Yeah. And he was afraid to do comedy. I'd never done it. He that. really was. Why were you afraid of the comedy? I'd never done it. I didn't know how. And you thought she did? Oh, yes. You knew she did? Oh, boy, did I ever. Did I ever. Um, and he was so good in it, but I know that he was afraid. What was but it? You she... see, I had a good teacher. However, critics also noted Doris Day's change of image and complimented her comedic talents, calling her blonde and glorious as ever, 
and that she handled her portrayal with brilliance and ease, with a touch of sophistication and glamour and calling Jan Morrow one of the best roles she ever had. And of course they also spent a good deal of time on her wardrobe. The Oscar nomination for Doris Day did come as a bit of a surprise. One review specifically mentioned, no Academy Awards will be given out as a result of this picture. And from today's point of view, many would argue that Marilyn Monroe should have been here instead for some like it hot. And this might seem possible. 1959 and 1960 were the years when Marilyn began to be taken more seriously as an actress. She won a David Di Donatello Award in Italy for her role in The Prince and the Showgirl, and later a Golden Globe for Some Like It Hot, over eventual Oscar nominee Doris Day. Plus, Some Like It Hot also garnered major nominations for director Billy Wilder and co-star Jack Lemmon, so it was clearly a movie the Academy responded to positively. However, looking at the coverage for Some Like It Hot, nobody mentioned a possible Oscar nomination for Marilyn Monroe, and it's also important to note that the Golden Globes in 1960 were handed out after the announcement of the Oscar nominations so a win did not have any effects anymore. Furthermore, Doris Day's nomination was not called a surprise because of the quality of her performance or because somebody else deserved it more, but rather because of the Academy's well-known aversion to comedy. Jack Lemmon's nomination was called a surprise for the same reason. So an Oscar nomination for Marilyn Monroe that year was never truly something anybody expected or thought possible. While she did gain attention for her acting talents, Hollywood's highest honor remained skeptical. And let's not forget that Pillow Talk did maybe not receive too many major Oscar nominations, but did win Best Original Screenplay over the likes of North by Northwest and Ingmar Bergman's Wild Strawberries. So it definitely struck a chord with the Academy. Story by Russell Rouse and Clarence Green. Screenplay by Stanley Shapiro and Maurice Richland. Pillow Talk. In Pillow Talk, Doris Day plays Jan Morrow, an interior decorator who shares a party line with Rock Hudson's Brad Allen, a Broadway composer and womanizer who constantly uses the phone for his private calls. Both never meet each other in person until Brad recognizes her one evening by accident. Wanting to seduce her without telling her who he actually is, he pretends to be a naive man from Texas and the usual game of love and betrayal begins. Excuse me, ma'am. Uh. Reckon it got a mite too close in here for your partner. Oh, yes. Um, I, I wonder if you would ask a couple of waiters to help get him Why, outside. Why, shucks, ma'am. No need to call anybody else. Why? Come on, boy. Up to Daisy. Even today, Pillow Talk is a lot of fun and it's easy to see why the movie was such a hit back then and is still well known today. The combination of what might be called innocent sexuality and a constant game of suggesting and hiding, carried by two charismatic and drop-dead gorgeous stars, has all the ingredients for a great evening. There are some jokes that feel rather sad with all that we know today. Well, there are some men who just, uh, well, they're very devoted to their mothers. You know, the type that likes to uh, collect cooking recipes or exchange bits of gossip. Ooh, what a vicious thing to say. But it still provides many laughs and the chemistry between Rock and Doris is top notch. And it's also very understandable why Doris Day found new success with this type of role. The character, innocent but sexy, funny but serious, intelligent but naive, fits her like a glove and is the ideal counterpoint to Rock Hudson's more relaxed, easygoing acting style. However, while Doris Day is certainly charming and amusing in her role, she does have the misfortune of playing the least memorable character in the story. Don't get me wrong, she is certainly Pillow Talk's reference point and the story follows her almost all the time, but her gen only becomes interesting when she engages with the players around her, who are all allowed to be a bit more crazy and a bit more funny. It's him. Mr. Allen. You're on my half hour. Party pooper. Her Jan is the straight character. She reacts to all the craziness around her and tries to make sense of it and, to be fair, Pillow Talk does need her calmer presence to counterbalance Rock Hudson's accent, Selma Ritter's drunkenness and Tony Randall's mother complex. 
but they are all offered more specific moments from the script. And while Doris Day is the one who has to carry the movie, she's also the one who gets the least amount of opportunities. If I gave you perfume, if I gave you lingerie, that would be personal, but, but a car? Come on, Mac, if it's yours, move it. Here, send me the perfume. Will you be stopping by my office tomorrow? In the afternoon. Listen. Are you sure you don't want the car? <laughs> yes, I'm sure, Jonathan. See you tomorrow. My analyst will never believe this. Neither will mine. Tell me about your job. It must be very exciting working with all them colors and fabrics and all. Would you like some dip? I'd love to. Oh. Thank you. Mmm. -hmm. Ain't they tasty? Mm. Wonder if I could get the recipe. Sure would like to surprise my ma when I go back home. Still, even if she has to play the straight character, Doris Day does manage to inject a good deal of humor into her performance, especially in her wordless reactions. He pushes a button and the couch becomes a bed with baby blue sheets. Really? Ooh. I get a nice warm feeling being near you, ma'am. It's like like being around a pop bellied stove on a frosty morning. <laughs> oh, Rex, what a lovely thing to say. Doris Day builds a close connection to the audience, but always in reference to her relationship with Rock Hudson's Brad. Her Jan therefore never becomes a full person, but Pillow Talk is also not asking that of her. And within the concept of the story, Doris Day's work may miss a certain edge to feel more alive, but still provides the necessary personality and charm to make the central love story work. Well, don't just sit there like a bump on a log. Make some casual conversation. It's a lovely evening, isn't it? Oh, yes, ma'am, it sure is. You married? Uh-oh. -uh. You idiot. What are you trying to do, scare the man away? No, ma'am, I'm not. This may take some fancy broken field running. All those buildings filled with people. Kind of scares a country boy like me, you know it? <laughs> Isn't that sweet? Of course, you ain't the kind of guy who'd break a date. No, I'm not. And I ain't the kind of guy that'd ask you to. I know you're not. I'll pick you up at eight. I'll be ready. In a way, Doris Day's work feels a bit more polished and rehearsed than that of her co-stars. She's obviously the performer with the biggest talent for comedy in the cast, but this also leads her to feel a bit less spontaneous and relaxed than everyone else. Tony, please! Jan, you're so... so primitive! Oh! Tony, control yourself! Remember, you're a Harvard man! Not tonight, baby. I'm on vacation. Only 21. I dig older women. Oh! I've never seen a boy with so many arms before. Tony, so help me, I'm gonna tell your mother. However, even if I might have some problems with this performance, I won't deny the charm and pure joy that Doris Day is able to project on the screen. I also appreciate how she never uses the character of Jan to get the audience on her side, but always stays within her personality, even if it occasionally means to let a moment that might be played broader pass by without taking full advantage. Has he used objectionable language on the phone? No. Or uh, threats of any nature? No. Has he made a moral overtures to you? Well, oh, not to me. And you're bothered by this? Yes. I mean, no. What do you mean bothered? But she is to be applauded for being so in sync with the style of the movie, combining a certain sense of innocence with an understanding of the world. 
And it's also thanks to her unique screen presence that Jan never appears to be dumb or like a fool. We'll just have to try living with one another. Well? I was waiting for you to make some off-color remark. Bedroom problems? Bedroom problems. Doris makes Jen so honest and straightforward in her feelings for Rock Hudson that we are constantly on her side in this relationship. We don't want her to be hurt even if we enjoy the antics of Brad as he fools her. You really came up here for your coat. What'd you think I came up for, man? I thought... Thought what, man? Well, I... I thought you brought me up here to... Oh, ma'am. I'm sorry, Rex. I should have known that you're not like the others, but I had to make sure. Will you forgive me? Of course, ma'am. Oh no, I always keep tomorrow night open. I mean, I hadn't, I hadn't planned a thing. Oh, I'd love to have dinner with you. Hello, hello, hello. Is anybody on this line? Yes, I am on the line. Would you please get off it? All right, but you're on my half hour. Ooh. Rex? Rex, are you there? Uh... Yes, ma'am. Who was that? Oh, my party line. A horrible little man. He sure isn't very well-mannered. Mannered? He isn't even worth talking about. Now. <sighs> what were you saying? And Doris Day never becomes a passive performer in all of this. An actress with lesser comedic skills might have taken an easy route here, winking at the audience that she is aware of the situation while feeling like a secondary character in her own story. Not Doris Day. She clearly works hard to achieve some actual human emotions, and while some moments of truth are clearly played for laughs, <laughs> you've been crying for 60 miles now. I, I know it. <laughs> She injects others with an honest and relatable touch that sometimes catches you by surprise and always brings the audience back on her side. Oh, Jan, how could you? How could you ever fall in love with a tourist? I don't know, I just did. You admit it, you just said it. You love him. I did, didn't I? His name isn't Rex Stetson, it's Brad Allen. I know that. He's a sneaking, double-crossing rat. I know that too. Will you please take me home? Of course. Bedroom problems. At least mine can be solved in one bedroom. You couldn't solve yours in a thousand. She's maybe not giving any depth to Jan, but still turning her into more than a human punch bag who is not in on the joke, but is the joke. Who is that woman? Some little eavesdropper on my party line. She's always listening in. So she brightens up her drab, empty life. If I could get a call through once in a while, my life wouldn't be so drab. So it's easy to understand why Jan seems like the quintessential Doris Day. Control yourself, Jan. I've never done anything like this before. All right, there has to be a first time. And I have to go to pieces over it. I'm so ashamed. I was always, you know, the image has been so boring. You know, the virgin... And the goody two-shoes and all the nonsense, which is, you know, it's not human. And I, I wanted to straighten the record. And um, Oscar Levant's remark has been quoted over and over again, and probably virgin. until you're almost sick of it, but it was a funny, funny remark. He was a funny yeah. man. And he said, I knew Doris Day before she was a virgin. She was a virgin. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that... It's funny. That, that's, it's funny. That's, it's that, funny. But you know, in my films, I don't know how that happened, where it came from. Doris Day is certainly a good sport for balancing the character of Jan between goofy and real, and working as a contrast to her three primary co-stars, allowing herself to be overshadowed occasionally with the simplicity of a portrayal, but always for the sake of keeping the picture grounded in its own reality. All right, you can stay till AA comes for you. I am leaving. No way. Just one dance and I'll go home, I promise. I don't believe you. Scouts on it. The role itself might not be the most challenging of her career, but she's a total delight on the screen and I for one am extremely happy that this wonderful actress got at least one nomination for all the joy she brought to us. 
Next, we will cover nominees two and three. This generation's greatest author and poet, writer of a streetcar named Desire and cat on a hot tin roof, unashamedly writes of a woman's strong wants and a man's strange needs. Something horrible happened to that girl last summer. Some dreadful traumatic experience of some kind. What? Suddenly Last Summer certainly is… something. This contemporary review sums it up the best. It's a story of sex, perversion, sadism and cannibalism played out in violence and emotional extremes. Miss Taylor is the woman who has seen her rich cousin, a degenerate poet named Sebastian, torn to pieces by a pack of starving children. Yeah. Even from today's point of view, this sounds like an extremely unique experience. Which makes it even more astonishing that the story made it to the screen in 1959 and that it was nominated for a couple of Oscars. On the one hand you might think, sure, Tennessee Williams' plays were very popular and it's not surprising that this one was turned into a movie as well. But his other controversial plays had the luxury of being critically acclaimed, award-winning Broadway productions that already had a lot of buzz and were therefore easier to accept as movie material. Tennessee Williams' Pulitzer Prize winning play unfolds with a shocking impact and uncompromising realism that makes its author the most talked about dramatist of our day. It won the Pulitzer Prize, the Critics' Award, the most revealing play ever written. New York, London, Paris, Brussels, Rome, all cheered it. It's an even greater motion picture. But suddenly Last Summer did not have the same origin story. In fact, it didn't even make it to Broadway until 1995. As a one-act play, it originally premiered off-Broadway in 1958, together with another one-act play, Something Unspoken, under the title Garden District. Therefore, Suddenly Last Summer did not have the same prestige as other Tennessee Williams plays at this point. Turning the story into a Hollywood production was therefore a huge risk, but one that paid off. Some critics praised the movie's daring themes and overall execution, calling it weirdly fascinating while others attacked the obvious topics and over-the-top nature of the plot. However, such condemnation and quotes like I deplore the garbage that is now being splashed on our screens, the trash and filth now going onto American screens will lead to a crippling censorship unless motion pictures quit telling dirty stories to our kids by John Wayne obviously made everyone want to see it, making it the seventh biggest box office hit of the year. But this success not only came due to the unusual story, but also the bona fide movie stars in the leading roles. It's no surprise that both Elizabeth Taylor and Catherine Hepburn were interested in this project, as Tennessee Williams was well known for writing great parts for actresses that would usually also get awards attention. But beyond that, these were also performances at crucial moments in both of these actresses' careers. Elizabeth Taylor was not only one of the most famous movie stars in the world in 1959, but also one of the most notorious. Her affair with Eddie Fisher, his divorce from Debbie Reynolds and their following marriage still caused headlines all over the country. So for her, continuing to prove her talents as an actress with another difficult part in another Tennessee Williams play after Cat on a Hot Tin Roof and other prestige pictures was a necessary step to avoid her private life taking over her professional career completely. Working with Williams' material and doing it really well helped her to achieve recognition as an actress when she was seen by many only as a homewrecker.
For Catherine Hepburn, suddenly last summer was a return to the screen after two years absence. It was her first movie since Desk Set with Spencer Tracy, after which she had worked extensively on the stage. And it's not surprising that she chose this movie as her return to the screen. Being based on Tennessee Williams, it was a great role for her, one that was sought after by many other actresses of a certain age, including Betty Davis. Millions of years ago, dinosaurs fed on the leaves of those trees. The dinosaurs are vegetarians, that's why they became extinct. They were just too gentle for their size. And then the carnivorous creatures, the ones that eat flesh, the killers, inherited the earth. But then they always do, don't they? Within her film work, Suddenly Last Summer was also a transition to a new phase of her career. The 50s were dominated by her spinster roles in movies such as The African Queen, Summertime and The Rainmaker. Maybe older spinsters, but still objects of affection. Suddenly Last Summer marked the beginning of something new. Catherine Hepburn as a mother. And what a way to start. What about my son? What sort of personal life did he have? He was chaste. You mean he was celibate? Yes. You, you don't believe me, do you? Do you believe that he yes, never? Yes, never. As strictly as if he'd taken a vow. This, um, this sounds like vanity, Doctor, but really I was actually the only one in his life that satisfied the demands he made of people. Of course, Catherine Hepburn's mothers were rarely what you expected. She could be warm. I have to be happy for her, man. And I am. But she could also be this. Henry? Mm -hmm. I have a confession. Yeah. I don't much like our children. Still, the spinster phase was over and she entered what columnists called the Ethel Barrymore phase of her career. Which is a bigger compliment than you might think at first. And it's true that she was no longer the object of affection, but played women in either settled relationships or with other problems than her love life. But in this grander scheme of things, Suddenly Last Summer was a really perfect transition. Violet Venable is not a spinster, but she also seems to reject any kind of relationship apart from that to her son, and since both her husband and her son are dead, she's also marked by loneliness and confusion. So she is a mother and a wife, but without a husband and a son. I'm a widow and a... Funny. There, there's no word. Lose your parents, you're an orphan. Lose your only son and you are... nothing. Even if critics were skeptical of the movie as a whole, they still praised the work by both actresses and considered them likely best actress nominees, calling them both excellent and brilliant and stating that the picture survived its dirtiness due to their tour de force performances. Elizabeth Taylor was highlighted for her splendid work and her compelling emotionalism, ready to burst into flames, and critics wrote that she gave a performance that will rank with the screen's all-time classics. Catherine Hepburn was praised for triumphing in a plum role and for investing her character with a sly insanity, was trained until she cracks up, and that her haughtiness was perfect for this role as she alternates between icy and melting with charm. However, when award season came along, Liz put herself into a comfortable lead with various Best Actress awards, including a Golden Globe, while Catherine Hepburn didn't win anything for her performance in the end. Still, this is not too surprising. If you ever saw the TV version of Suddenly Last Summer with Maggie Smith and Natasha Richardson, which follows the actual play, you notice that the roles of Violet and Catherine are initially balanced very evenly. Both given big monologues, both sharing equal importance, with the role of Violet maybe even being a bit larger than that of Catherine. The movie version on the other hand shifted this focus and made Catherine the clear central character of the story. And while Catherine Hepburn played her part rather quietly and controlled, Elizabeth Taylor is allowed to go very big. I mean, really big. Therefore leaving a bigger impression on most audience members when the story is over. In the movie, Elizabeth Taylor plays Catherine Hawley, a young woman who suffers a nervous breakdown after witnessing the death of her cousin Sebastian, and who is locked up in a mental institution while her aunt tries her best to have her lobotomized to make sure that the truth about Sebastian's death will never be revealed. While the character of Catherine is a naturally showy part, the movie version of Suddenly Last Summer actually increased the level of difficulty, and also made it harder for Elizabeth Taylor to make sense of it all. 
The stage play focuses only on the one evening when all characters come together and wait for Catherine to tell the story of what happened to her cousin Sebastian. While it is often mentioned that Cassie has lost her mind, the character itself has a clear recollection of the traumatic events, but has been shut away for months and did not see either her aunt, her family or Dr. Kukrowitz before the story takes place. This compression of the plot makes many scenes far more straightforward than in the movie. Aren't they awful? <laughs> Sebastian and I used to speculate on how that family of Neanderthals could have produced a girl as rare as Catherine. You know, these, these people are not blood relatives of mine. They're my dead husband's relations are with the tested thing. My dead husband's sister and her two worthless children. Well, I was, I was disgusted. Second. And by opening the plot up for the screen, stretching out the time frame and letting Catherine interact with other characters far more frequently, it was necessary to give specific reasons for dragging the truth out for so long. In this case, it's explained that Catherine is suffering from a loss of memory in regards to Sebastian's death. This puts Elizabeth Taylor in the difficult position to constantly give long monologues that hint at everything, to remember a lot of persons and various events in connection to Sebastian and even his death, but not the ultimate question of how. Well, when you went off your rocket in Europe... George! Shut up, Mama. Kathy's not that far gone, are you, Kathy? When I went off my rocker in Europe... Hey, you said something or other. You made up some crazy story or other about Sebastian. When Aunt Vi heard it, whatever it was... Even last night at supper, not a word would she say, except that you babbled. That was her word for it. You babbled some story about Sebastian and how he lived and died. In a place called Cabeza de Lobo. But she handles these contradictions extremely well, even if she's sometimes too sure in the part she does know, considering how dangerous it is for her to know everything. We were decoys. Decoys? For Sebastian, he, he used us as bait. And when she was no longer able to lure the better fish into the net, he let her go. Bait? For what? What were the better fish? We procured for him. She used to do it in the smart, fashionable places they went to before last summer. Sebastian was shy with people. She wasn't. Neither was I. However, you cannot deny the full commitment of Elizabeth Taylor in this role. While many of her performances suffer from her very thin voice, she handles the dialogue of Tennessee Williams with astonishing ease, adding a sense of poetry, doom and regret to many of her scenes. I tried to save him, Doctor. Save him from what? Completing a, a sort of image he had of himself as a, as a sort of a sacrifice to a terrible sort of a... God? Yes. Sebastian, who was gentle, kind, saw something not gentle, not kind in the universe. Something, something terrible in himself. The beach was very white. Oh, how the sun burned. It was, it was like the eye of God watching us. Burning, burning. There was no air that day. The, the sun had burned up all the air. Outside, it was like inside a, a furnace. He took me home, but he took me another place first, near the Dueling Oaks at the end of Esplanade Street. We stopped. I asked, what for? He didn't answer. Just struck a match in the car to light a cigarette in the car, and I looked at him in the car, and I knew what for. And she also manages to overcome the fact that the movie makers make no secret of their desire to exploit her popularity. I want you to know that I can look attractive if I have my hair done, and if. When I'm at Lion's View, may I wear a pretty dress? If you like. Which is why Catherine walks around like this in a mental institution, and she had to do this scene clearly for one reason alone. I came out looking naked. Why did he do that? Do you know why he did that? Yes. To attract attention. Why? Because he thought you were lonely? Did he think he could shock you out of your depression? You know why I was doing it. I told you. I was procuring for him. 
Sebastian was lonely, Doctor. That empty Blue Jay notebook got bigger and bigger. So big it was big and empty like that big empty blue sea and sky. But even with all this, Elizabeth Taylor constantly displays her desire to truly lose herself in the part of Catherine, making her scenes opposite Montgomery Cliff particularly engaging by never revealing just how aware Catherine truly is, teasing him when she finds the opportunity to, constantly moving between insanity and understanding, working very hard to make sense of Catherine being both the most lost but also the most aware character in the whole story and observing everything going on around her. Oh, she is merciless, isn't she? Who? Aunt Violet. Why else do you think I'm here? When no one can see me, hear me. You sound as if you think she hates you. <laughs> Doesn't she? Do you hate her? What, hate? No. I don't understand what hate is. I don't see how anyone could hate and still be sane. And I really do think I am sane despite considerable evidence to the contrary. None of us ever had a choice once Sebastian had decided we were to be... to be used. Used? You mean he used people? Yes. Isn't that what love is? Using people? And maybe that's what hate is. Not being able to use people. I'm making you nervous. You have every reason to be. Because now I am going to attack you. Yes, attack. But it won't be for your beauty. No, it's for these cigarettes. For heaven's oh. sake, Doctor, let me have of one. Of course, help yourself. Where are you from? Lion's View. The state is out. Besides this, Elizabeth Taylor also works very well opposite the other cast members, displaying a cool affection for her family and portraying both anger and fear to her aunt. Mother, you didn't sign those papers. You didn't commit me to Lion's View. Not yet. Mama told me how you got her to agree to commit me here and then let them... She seems disturbed, Doctor. Aunt Violet, I am disturbed. Don't you think I have every reason to be? There's often a rebellious attitude in her characterization, acting in a way that is expected by everyone, being told so many times that she is crazy, that she has accepted the premise without feeling like it. I molested an elderly gardener of great virtue. When he refused my advances, I denounced him as a lecher. And for that I was punished. Was it true? That I was punished? Oh, yes. But you accused him unjustly. Of course I accused him unjustly. After all, I'm insane. It's the sort of thing an insane woman would do. Help me! Don't. Don't talk like that. Why not? Now I sound insane, don't I? Are you trying to? No, and I'm not. You've got to believe me, Doctor. I am not. But even if her dedication is impressive and often even overwhelming, Elizabeth Taylor also occasionally exaggerated her part. She shines with her monologues and whenever she is asked to add an aura of mystery to her part, especially in more quiet moments. We'll fly north, little bird. It's what he call me sometimes. Little bird. We'll walk under those radiant, cold northern lights. I've never seen the aurora borealis. Well, he never saw those northern lights. But fails when she needs to engage with other characters in a more straightforward manner. Oh. Catherine, just Catherine. What happened? What happened then? I don't remember. <laughs> There's only one little operation they perform here. It's on the brain. It's called a lobotomy. You may have heard of it or read about it. I have. He bores holes into the skull and operates on the brain! Still, it's impossible to deny the effect of her final scenes, revealing the truth about what actually happened to Sebastian. 
Using the memory of the death of her husband Mike Todd, she lets Catherine relive her lost memories with an ever-growing intensity, creating an unforgettable moment of terror carried by her voice and face alone. And those children, there was a, a band of them. They, they looked like a flock of plucked birds and they came darting up to the wire fence as if they'd been blown there by the wind, by the, the hot white wind from the sea and they were all calling out Pan, pan, pan. They were calling for bread. They made gobbling noises with their mouths. He suddenly pushed himself away from the table and said, They've got to stop that. Make them stop that. I'm not a well man. I have a heart condition. It's making me sick. Up. Straight up. That was the only way open, so he went that way. He tried to escape from those streets. He tried to escape from those streets. But he couldn't find a way out. He couldn't find a way out. How he still ran, he never ran, but he ran and he ran and he ran where it was quieter and emptier. What was emptier? The light, the sky and the light. Those deep white streets and the sun and everything blazed white and empty. Where did those streets lead to? Nowhere. He never reached. He never reached the end. He screamed just once. I, I, then I, then I, I, then I. I would not say that Elizabeth Taylor gives the kind of character performance she would a couple of years later in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Her work in Suddenly Last Summer always remains a movie star performance, but still on a very high level, realized with clear precision and focus. She maybe did not surprise us on the screen as she took a great part and gave an accordingly great, but also expected performance without adding any true dimensions herself, but you cannot deny the sheer intensity she brought to her character. Still, even if the performance of Elizabeth Taylor made the bigger impact in 1959, for me, there is someone else who walks away with this picture. As already mentioned, the part of Violet Venable feels a bit secondary in the movie version of Suddenly Last Summer compared to the play. Besides building up the role of Catherine by focusing on the loss of her memory, even one of Violet's speeches was given to her. I got back with Cable, Mr. Venable, critically ill, stop. Once you stop, needs you stop. Immediate return advised, most strongly stop. Did you go back to your husband? I, I made the hardest decision of my life. I stayed with my son. While they were there, word came. Mr. Venable was dying. He had to see her. And she chose to stay? She chose to let her husband die alone. However, the character of Violet still benefited from the restructuring of the plot. While she is much more straightforward in her intentions in the play... Would you still be interested in my work at Lion's View? I mean, would the Sebastian Venable Memorial Foundation still be interested in it? Are we always more interested in a thing that concerns us personally, Doctor? I can't guarantee that a lobotomy will stop her babbling. Maybe, maybe not. But after the operation... Who would believe her, Doctor? My God. She's allowed to be a bit more subtle here. Well, as subtle as a story like Suddenly Last Summer allows. Mrs. Venable, uh, what can I tell Dr. Huckstarter about your interest in helping us? Can't that us? wait until after you've met my niece and decided whether or not you think your operation could help her? Yes, of course, of course it can wait. But surely there is no connection between... Aren't we always more interested in something that concerns us personally? Aren't we, Doctor? I understand. In the hands of Catherine Hepburn, Violet Venable is still clearly more what would be described as crazy than her niece Catherine, but her wealth and influence allow her a certain behavior without being questioned. Catherine Hepburn never emphasizes the mental instability of Mrs. Venable necessarily, but place her as a woman who lives in her own world and acts accordingly, who is used to get what she wants and also used to have everyone accept every word she says. I brought you some of Sebastian's papers, odds and ends, and this, the thing you wanted. Your son's death certificate? Mrs. Venable, I know how painful this in must Spanish, be for you. In case you don't read Spanish, I, I read Spanish. Oh. 
Well, I have a translation. As you see, there was no mystery, no matter what the girl said at the time or any other time. It says the body was somewhat damaged in falling. Where did he fall? On the ground. Where else do you fall when you die in the hot sun? In the street of some godforsaken village. Did you see his body when it was It was a primitive country. The coffin came to us sealed. I'll wait in the garden now. That is where you want me? Yes, if you will. Dr. Hochstatter, let me show you my son's garden. It's very unusual, like the dawn of creation. And in playing this attitude, this loosening grip on reality combined with a strong sense of self-assuredness, Catherine Hepburn created one of the most fascinating characters of her career, and probably also had the best entrance in film history. Sebastian always said, Mother, when you descend, it's like the goddess from the machine. She's on her way down. Mrs. Venable's on and her way down. you're just like an angel coming to Earth as I float, float into view. Sebastian, my son Sebastian, was very interested in the Byzantine. Are you interested in the Byzantine, Dr. K uh, Kukrovitz? No, I don't know very much about the Byzantine. Well, it seems that the Emperor of Byzantium, when he received people in audience, had a throne, which during the conversation would rise mysteriously in the air to the consternation of the visitors. But as we are living in a democracy, I reverse the procedure. I don't rise, I come down. <laughs> Catherine Hepburn perfectly embodies this type of woman, rich, ruthless, domineering, and with a borderline incestuous affection for her son. I know it sounds hopelessly vain to say, but we were a famous couple. People didn't speak of Sebastian and his mother or Mrs. Venable and her son, no. They said uh, Sebastian and Violet. Violet and Sebastian are staying at the Lido. They're at the Ritz in Madrid. And every appearance... Every time we appeared, attention was centered on us. Even when I was with him, even with me, he would sometimes be frightened, but I would know when and what of. I'd reach across the table to him and touch his hands. Say not a word, just look. And touch his hands with my hand. Oh, you were superior to mere mortals. So we were. We needed no one but one another. Sebastian only needed you while you were still useful. Useful. I mean young, able to attract. She's babbling again, babbling and lying. He left her home because she had lost her... Because you stole him. Lost her attraction. What would attraction have to do with a son and a mother? Like Elizabeth Taylor, Catherine Hepburn uses the dialogue of Tennessee Williams to her advantage. But while Elizabeth Taylor gives it the expected poetic quality, Catherine Hepburn plays with her lines like a musical instrument, being threatening and lovable within seconds, leading the story and the character from one place to the next. Like the dawn of creation. It was Sebastian's idea, part of his lifelong war against the herbaceous border. Not unlike a well-groomed jungle and, frankly, a little terrifying. So was creation. So is creation. We listen to them birds. What's in there? This way before our poor lady dies of hunger. The Latin names to the plants are printed on tags attached to them with the prints fading out. Those ones there are the oldest plants on earth. Survivors from the age of the giant fern forest. And here's my poor lady. They never get away. The lady exudes this marvelous perfume which attracts them. They plunge into a chalice. And they never come out. This operation you perform is called... Uh, lobotomy. That certainly I is an unusual flies. plan. Fox Hill! Like a flock of birds, she changes her direction from one moment to the next, never exaggerating her performance, but bringing a matter-of-fact quality to her scenes that create a startling, almost frightening effect. Because the work of a poet is the life of a poet, and vice versa, the life of a poet is the work of a poet. I mean, you can't separate them. I, I mean, a uh, poet's life is his work, and his work is his life in a special sense. Uh, oh. Are you all right? Right as rain, however right that is. This operation of yours, does it really work? You say that your niece suffers from dementia precox. There must have been a more exact diagnosis. Such a pretty name for a disease. Sounds like a rare flower, doesn't it? Night blooming dementia precox. 
Whenever you enter the brain with a foreign object, yes. even a needle-thin knife yes. in the hands of the most skilled surgeon, yes. there yes. still is a great deal of risk. But it does pacify them. I've read that. It quiets them down. It suddenly makes them peaceful. Elizabeth Taylor might always have the grander scenes opposite her, but Catherine Hepburn effortlessly dominates these conversations by sheer presence and the sheer conviction of Mrs. Venable's righteousness. Would you want to see Catherine? Is that why? It might help me. But, uh, but, but um, the lawyer... Uh, well, surely you've kept the lawyer waiting before. Yes, I have. Such a strong, such a persuasive doctor. We would have seen each other before this. At St. Mary's, they wouldn't let any of us see you. We both made contacts for him. I can't listen to this obscenity. Stop her, doctor. Cut the truth out of my brain. Is that what you want, Anne Fye? Well, you can't. Not even God can change the truth that we were nothing but a pair of... Doctor! It's the truth! See how she destroys us with her tongue for a hatchet. You've got to cut this hideous story out of her brain. And she also elegantly goes through her scenes opposite Montgomery Clift, slowly wrapping him up in her own point of view, but also keeping a clear distance, almost like a hunter waiting for the right moment to kill. And you'll be happy to know that at this very minute, my lawyers are working on the Sebastian Venable Memorial Foundation. We need help, particularly in a field as experimental as mine, particularly at a state hospital like Lyons View. But we have very little money, practically none. Yes, I know. Doctor, I have a niece by marriage at a place called St. Mary's. Mrs. Holly told me about your letter. Oh, so you've seen her too, have you? I must say, you have been observing. Well, there was no letter, only a death certificate. I'd like to see that if I Why? Might. I think it's important. I want to know what happened the day your son died. You shall have it tomorrow. And tomorrow you shall also have the permission to operate. And now I'd better go. I've got lawyers waiting for me. You'd think giving you a building was a simple matter, but apparently I'm assigned papers until I drop. Her famous monologue about the sea turtles is probably the closest Suddenly Last Summer comes to a true horror movie, simply due to her ability to tell the story with a heart-stopping tension. It's a long and dreadful thing, the depositing of the eggs in the sand pits. And when it's finished, the exhausted female turtle crawls back to the sea, half dead. The narrow beach. The color of caviar was all in motion. But the sky was in motion too, full of flesh-eating birds. And the noise of the birds. Their horrible savage cries as they circled over the narrow black beach of the Encantados. I said no. No. That's not true. But he said it is. He said, look, Violet. Look, there on the shore. And I looked and saw the sand all alive, all alive as the new hatch sea turtles made their dash to the sea while the birds hovered and swooped to attack and hovered and swooped to attack until suddenly last summer I learned my son was right that what he had shown me in the Encantados was the horrible, the inescapable truth and even in her final scenes, she never takes the opportunities of the script for going big, but again almost underplays her scenes, making her exit just as memorable as her entrance. I'm going up to see the captain now, tell him to change our course for home. Oh, Sebastian, what a lovely summer it's been. Just the two of us, Sebastian and Violet. Violet and Sebastian, just the way it's always going to be. Oh, we are lucky, my darling, to have one another and need no one else, ever. Catherine Hepburn's Violet is not the kind of villain you either love or love to hate or pity. Instead, she's a strange but also unique presence that overwhelms everything around her without suffocating the movie or the other characters leaving a lasting impression that makes you want to know more, but still gives the audience everything it needs. Tomorrow, I want 
what that girl operated on. Now, Mrs. Venable, that is a decision that more rightly belongs to the doctor in charge, who is also the surgeon. Doctor, I don't want to hear from you again until the operation has been performed. Tennessee Williams himself was overall very happy with both actresses. He famously thought that Elizabeth Taylor was maybe miscast and not believable as a woman who did not know that she was being used for, quote, something evil, but she still rose above it with her acting abilities. Of Catherine Hepburn he said, Kate is a playwright's dream actress. She makes dialogue sound better than it is by a matchless beauty and clarity of diction and by a fineness and intelligence and sensibility that illuminates every shade of meaning in every line she speaks. She invests every scene, each bit with the intuition of an artist born to her part. So Suddenly Last Summer is a strange but also fascinating picture with two intriguing female performances that beautifully show two different approaches to the material, both succeeding in their own way, even if one of them succeeded more. And the next nominee is… En de rol zelf in de film, hoe is u dat mee gevallen? Het is een moeilijke rol. Ja, dat kan ik me voorstellen. Moeilijk en ik heb, ik heb heel hard gewerkt, zoals iedereen. We hebben ons best gedaan. En ik hoop dat, dat het zo ook zal aflopen waar het publiek mm -hmm. aan gaat. En uh, daar weer, is het, het was een hele een ernstig onderwerp. En ik hoop dat we het eer aan gedaan hebben. Maar... Audrey Hepburn is such an iconic presence on the screen that it is often hard to separate the personality from her art. The black dress, the big hat, the chic outfits, the haircut, all of it became a part of pop culture history. And this makes it easy to forget that A, she was also a highly acclaimed actress and B, her filmography is not as extensive as you might think. She only made a handful of movies during the 50s after her big breakthrough with Roman Holiday. But she did end the decade with the performance that she herself was most proud of and that is also regarded by her fans as the artistic high point of her career, when she was not notable on the screen for her appearance, but only for her talents. Critics reacted very positively to her work too, describing it as a tour de force and the greatest challenge of her career, and stating that she was finally given a chance to prove depth of feeling and skill in projecting emotion and that she brings compassion and genuine understanding to the difficult role of a woman whose spiritual goals were too high for her emotions and intellect. The best performance by a British actor, Audrey Hepburn in The Nun Story. The Nun Story is a surprisingly engaging and complex story that follows a young woman who enters a convent and during the following years has to accept that she cannot live by all the rules that are created for this kind of life. Dear Lord, the more I try, the more imperfect I become. I seem to fail in charity, humility and obedience. Pride has not been burned out of me. When I succeed in obeying the rule, I fail at the same time because I have pride in succeeding. It's based on the real-life story of Marie-Louise Habé, who also became a good friend of Audrey Hepburn and even nursed her when she got injured during the making of The Unforgiven. Thank you, Mother. I don't know if I'm well yet, but I feel so well. So completely well. It's strange that I had to fall ill to learn to take each day and each night as a gift from God. Without struggle. It seems impossible that when I say my culpa to you next, I don't think I'll have any imperfections against the rule to proclaim. Except that tonight you talk during the grand silence. It's overall a movie that never judges its characters nor their intentions and gives deep insight into an unknown world. The scenes set in Africa are of course what you would expect from a movie made during that time. Yambo. Mama Luke. Yambo, Mama Luke. Only one generation ago their fathers were savages in the forest. We couldn't run the hospital without them. But it's nevertheless a simple story told in a simple manner with a grand eye for detail and time to breathe giving the journey of its central character the needed room to develop and engage the audience. And the fact that it is so engaging is due to Audrey Hepburn, who fulfills all expectations you might have of her and goes far, far beyond that in a performance that, like that of the quote other Hepburn, 
belongs to the most unforgettable creations in Oscar history. But before I start with the praise for Audrey Hepburn's performance, just one thing. If you are in any way an actress lover like me, then The Nun's story is your bible. I mean, look at this cast list, Ben Hur could never. We have Colleen Dewhurst fighting with Audrey Hepburn, British dames Edith Evans and Peggy Ashcroft as mentors with different styles, and many character actresses that are often only known for one movie. So it's a great treat to see familiar faces in a different surrounding. My child, I don't underestimate for a moment the seriousness of your faults. But you mustn't destroy yourself with guilt and remorse. You must learn to bend a little or you'll break. Long before I entered the order, I had a rule of my own. All or nothing. I want to be a good nun or... You will be a good nun, Sister Luke. I thought one would reach some sort of resting place. Where obedience would be natural and struggle would end. There is no resting place, ever. But you must have patience with yourself. Unhappy saints are lost from the beginning. Ask for God's help and guidance, and I know you will make your final vows. Audrey Hepburn's performance in The Nun Story is the exact opposite of those that have been discussed so far. They were outgoing, working hard to create specific reactions from the audience and crafted for specific purposes. Audrey Hepburn, on the other hand, plays a woman who wants to learn how to hide her personality and her character so deep inside herself that only a shell with the intention to honor God remains. Have you ever assisted at an operation before? Yes. My father's Dr. Hubert von der Mull. Oh, I see. You'll say another five others and beg your soup for that little display of pride, sister. It's also a performance that never wants to bring the audience on her side or create any bond between her character and the viewer. Instead, Sister Luke's struggle between her own rules and those of the convent are displayed purely within, never aiming for a greater purpose, and the reason we follow along is because Audrey Hepburn is able to make this journey and struggle such a complex masterpiece. You're blushing. It happened to me too in my ward. We shouldn't blush, I'm sure we shouldn't. How can we help it? it? Must mean some wrong awareness of self. Must we write it in our notebooks? I don't know. Should we write that we talked alone? Audrey Hepburn's performance in The Nun's Story certainly benefited from the structure of the movie. The story is almost divided into different chapters. Gabrielle's first arrival at the convent, her struggle to learn the rules to become a good nun, her time at a tropical school and a mental asylum, then her time in Africa and finally the years of the war. This way the story does not become one-dimensional and keeps the viewer interested. But again this would not work without Audrey Hepburn's presence as well as her astonishing ability to show years of inner struggle and discomfort without barely showing anything at all. Say six hours and a paternoster for that bit of vanity, sister. Audrey Hepburn also beautifully displays the contradictions of Sister Luke without making them seem like a flaw of her characterization. Gabrielle is a woman who joins the convent not only to become a nun but also to become a nurse. From the way she talks and acts, you can even think that being a nurse is more important to her, but Audrey Hepburn clearly shows that her love for God is not of secondary importance, nor does she herself value one thing more than the other. I just want to become a good nurse and a good nun and to do God's work wherever I'm sent. First, become a good nun. We select only the very strongest sisters for our missions. 
Your nursing qualifications would seem to make you a likely candidate, but you are still very far from being mature in the religious life. Her first scenes clearly show how joining the convent is something she thought about in great detail and sees as the right choice for herself. At this moment, we don't need long explanations to understand her reasons, since Audrey Hepburn's performance tells it all. Well, are we off? Whenever you're ready, Father. Let's not wait for that. Your hat's on crooked. I try to put it on without a mirror to get used to. <laughs> now, Louise. I left some things upstairs for you and Marie. Divide the dresses, but you keep the blue ones because blue is your color. <laughs> Goodbye, Father. I'll miss you. I'll do my best. I want you to be proud of me. I don't want to be proud of you. I want you to be happy. I am happy. For Sister Luke, being a nurse and being a nun complement each other. They fulfill her two biggest needs in life and fulfill her as a person. But during the movie, she has to learn that both of these passions cannot coexist in the way that she wants. There are times when my conscience asks which has priority, it or the holy rule. When the bell calls me to chapel, I often have to sacrifice what might be the decisive moment in a spiritual talk with a patient. I'm late every day for chapel or refectory or both. When I have night duty, I break the grand silence because I can no longer cut short a talk with a patient who seems to need me. Mother, why must God's helpers be struck down by five bells in the very hours when men in trouble want to talk about their souls? You entered the convent to be a nun, not to be a nurse. The religious life must be more important to you than your love of myths. During the first parts of the nun story, Audrey Hepburn also succeeds to make Sister Luke's determination to become a good nun and truly inhabit the rules of the convent never phony or exaggerated, but always a truthful desire. The simplicity of the characterization works wonderfully to create a complex inner life that is always in constant struggle with itself. To go on would be cheating God to be a hypocrite. We all have our doubts. My confessor. Of course. But I know myself. I could never be like you. As strong as you. I'm the weakest of us all. Goodbye. Pray for me. Her fight to rid herself of all pride and accept complete obedience is the primary force in her life at the convent and even if she more and more integrates herself into a nun's life, it's a fight that she cannot win. Would you, Sister Luke, be able to fail your examination to show humility? Mother, I would be willing if the mother house knows of this and approves.
disobedience. Always disobedience. Don't try to talk. I would probably have done the same thing. The amazing thing about Audrey Hepburn's work in an unstory is that everything about this performance seems rather simple, but she reveals layer after layer to unmask this three-dimensional character in Sister Luke, and she lets the performance slowly grow with the progress of the story. Sister Luke never drastically changes, but Audrey Hepburn shows how she is still a different woman at the end, more assured in her tasks and the interaction with the other sisters. And she also works wonderfully opposite Peter Finch. We don't get what might be expected, a relationship of unrequited love or forbidden feelings, but a purely platonic, professional relationship, shaped by mutual respect and friendship. I don't know what to do, Doctor. I have TB. Who says so? Who told you that? I just made a test. It'll mean my going back to Europe. But you're the only one in the whole Congo I can work with. I can't lose you. But most of all, this is a performance that displays all of its magic in the final moments. When Sister Lou comes to the decision that she cannot obey anymore, that she cannot live according to the rules of the convent while the war is raging outside its doors, Audrey Hepburn wordlessly communicates an overwhelming amount of both doubt and sincerity. Today a German war nurse died here. And try as I would, I couldn't regret it. My whole life work has been dedicated to saving lives. And I almost rejoiced. Perhaps it is too much to ask. Father, I don't believe that. It is not too much to ask. I simply cannot obey. Her decision to leave the convent is made with as much determination as the one to enter, but it's a completely different situation. The scenes of Sister Luke realizing that she cannot ignore the terror of the Nazis is obviously even more touching due to Audrey Hepburn's own backstory. Spent the whole war in Arnhem. Yeah. Wasn't it pretty awful? Yes, it was very bad. I did give performances to collect money for the underground, which always needed money. And what about the Germans? What did they do about it? Know about it. Uh, there was a knock on the door and they took my uncle away who six months later was shot and another uncle too and my brothers went underground. My uncles were the first hostages to be shot in Holland and it was actually the turning point because from that day on an underground was formed. If ever I can be of help, tell me. Hurry. Hurry. Did you mean that? About help. Dear Lord, forgive me, I cannot obey anymore. What I do from now on is between you and me alone. But this is not the reason for the success of her characterization, which stands firmly on its own. The last minutes of the Nun story are like a punch in the stomach. Audrey Hepburn shows that this final decision is right for Sister Luke, but it still costs her more than she could imagine. And she turns this moment into one of the most devastating scenes ever recorded. And suddenly you realize how deeply you have been drawn into the story of Sister Luke, her struggles and her happiness, and how you are right with her. The miracle of Audrey Hepburn's staggering portrayal will remain in your mind forever. I love the part, it really is, it's, it's a terribly good part, it's, I would say, an exceedingly difficult one, difficult for me anyway. Looking at these four nominees, it is understandable why none of them took home the gold. Those days' performance missed the prestige and was more an acknowledgement of her general star power. 
Suddenly Last Summer was likely too controversial for the Academy's taste, and voters surely were hesitant to give a second Oscar to Audrey Hepburn so soon. So it is no surprise that, in the end, they went with one of their favorite characters, the suffering wife. Uh, of course, even in this last and most celebrated part, perhaps, that you played of Alice in Room at the Top, mm. it was a, a, what many English people thought was a, was, was a wicked woman. I mean, how did the public react to Alice? Wonderfully, because it's a... I'd like to say something about that part. It's, a, it's one of the best part you can have to play. I mean, I've played uh, uh, bad women and, and wicked women, and, and it doesn't pay. I mean, the people don't like you after that. They hate you, and they're right, because if you do it well, they just don't like you because you're hateable. Uh, this part is such a warm, wonderful part because she's uh, not very young, she's not very pretty, she's honest, though she cheats her husband, but he's not a good husband, so... And, uh, and she dies on the top, so... So it's, it's like a piece of cake for an actress. One thing right ahead. My referring to Simone Signoret's character as the stereotypical suffering wife is not meant dismissively. Because while it's true that Alice Askill is essentially that, the wonderful thing about this performance is that it shatters all expectations usually associated with a role like this. Simone Signoret took a cliched character and gave it a new and swelling spin that does not come from either the script or the direction, but simply from her own acting and distinctive screen presence. But with her performance, Simone Signoret did not only overcome any established ideas about her character, but also about stardom in general and how a leading lady could look like and behave in an environment so determined to follow a small pattern of accepted stereotypes. But how did she do it? Simone Signoret began her career during the years of World War II in various uncredited bit parts. Her talent and unique looks brought her more attention in the post-war years in movies like Phantomas and Backstreets of Paris. During that time, she married director Yves Allegray, who cast her in her first leading role in Dédé d'Anvers, where, also for the first time, she played the signature character of her career, the prostitute with the heart of gold. The same year, she also proved that she could handle roles in international productions with her first English-speaking part in Against the Wind. Don't laugh at me, woman. Don't dare laugh at me. Stop it, will you? Stop it. I'm sorry, Johnny. But I don't love you. Nor anyone else, Johnny. You're good to I come in and tell him you love me. You're out, not me. Both her performances as well as her looks garnered her some international attention, but a big breakthrough came in the next decade with more prominent roles, as well as her marriage to Yves Montand, which turned them into one of the most famous French couples. She started the 50s with Laurent and starred in other big roles in movies such as Therese Raquin, Les Diaboliques, Casque d'Or and The Crucible, with the last two garnering her awards by the British Academy as the best foreign actress, which continued to raise her profile. However, the peak of her international success came in 1959 with her role as Alice Askill in the controversial drama Room at the Top. It's been hell these last weeks. I want you all the time. Not just stolen meetings. Because all trailers must carry a U certificate, we are unable to show you scenes which the censor has passed for adult audiences only. Room at the Top, sensationally serialized in the Daily Express. Now from the book's shock-provoking pages come the characters that have caused such a storm of emotion. Simon Signoret, one of Europe's greatest stars, two-time award winner for the Best Actress of the Year, now in another brilliant portrayal as Alice Askill. She was French and all woman, ten years older than Joe, ten years more experienced. 
Unfortunately, I could not find any information on how Simone Signori was cast in this role, which of course meant to make the very British character of Alice French in the movie version of John Brain's novel. It seems that the movie makers originally wanted Vivian Lee for the part, who declined. English actress Jean Kent was very eager to play Alice, later stating, it was this old English thing that only foreigners have sex appeal. And it seems that this hit the nail on the head, that the casting of Simone Signore was the result of a general stereotype thinking that sees women from France as sexually more aggressive and liberated than women from England or the US. I'd like a picture of you like that. There is a picture of me in the nude, somewhere. <laughs> You're joking. No, there really is. I was at the university at that time, and I met an artist at a party. He wanted a model. I don't suppose it was even a good painting. How often did you do this? Only once. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. I don't tell lies, you know that. You never told me. Why didn't you tell me? Because I had forgotten about it. Oh, darling, with the first. I didn't sleep with him, if that's what you're thinking. Turning Alice A's skill French did, at least to my knowledge, not cause any complaints. And if there were, they were basically forgotten by the moment Room at the Top hit the theaters. The production itself was mostly praised by critics who recognized that, while the story did not really have anything new to tell, it was still done in an engaging manner and much more daring than other movies from this time. The award, this is the, Mr. Havlin is going to read you the name of the film that Room. has won the award from the best of, of, of many sources. Room at the Top. However, most of all, Room at the Top was the beginning of a maybe short, but still very intense love affair between the American public and Simone Signore, who was described as the biggest sensation since Marlene Dietrich. And there were a couple of reasons for that. One, her performance in Room at the Top. Basically, all critics agreed that Simone Signore walked away with the picture, stating that she played her role with a directness and lack of theatrics, which are cumulatively impressive calling her unforgettable and magnificent in the smallest scenes, conveying words of meaning with a lifted eyebrow, a sudden breath, a shoulder shrug or quiet intonation, and predictions for an Oscar nomination, maybe even a win, were immediate. And two, because of her off-screen personality and what it represented, both in regards to the general ideas of movie stardom as well as the character of Alice Askell. At this point, only a couple of actresses older than Simone Signore had won the Best Actress Oscar. Marie Dressler, Joan Crawford, Shirley Booth, Anna Magnani, Ingrid Bergman and Susan Hayward. But what separated Simone Signore from these other actresses was the nature of the part. Alice was the most sexual character that had been seen up to this moment in this category, and the fact that she was not played by a young actress who fulfilled Hollywood's conventional notions of beauty, but by an ancient 39-year-old woman, turned Simone Signore into such an unprecedented sensation. John, I, I think it should be said that Miss Signore's performance in Room at the Top is one of the most beautiful jobs that Thank you done in movies in long time. That it was. Agree. Here, here. No, I agree. It won an Academy Award, I believe. Now, actually, uh... However, breaking with established traditions is not only exciting, but will also be met by criticism. Newspapers noted the unusual appeal of Simone Signore, but were also eager to highlight what they considered her shortcomings. She was described as far from beautiful, a bit dumpy, carelessly groomed and admitting to 39. Even more, reviewers warned that you'll probably be shocked when she appears on the screen the first time. You may even say, this woman has an attraction? I mean... Fuck you. If you watch Room at the Top and don't think that Simon Signore is one of the most beautiful human beings you ever laid eyes on, then there is something wrong with you. Sorry, I don't make the rules. In fact, Simon Signore was only one year older than Doris Day when she made Pillow Talk, 
and nobody focused on her age. And similarly, age was also not an issue for Susan Hayward or Ingrid Bergman. But again, these cases were different because in their movies, sex was either a joke or played no role at all. And they also had the luxury of having grown older in front of the camera, and audiences still had the image of them as younger stars. Simone Signore, however, was largely unknown before Room at the Top and was therefore approached completely differently. As with Anna Magnani a couple of years earlier, the media did not know how to react to Simone Signore, but was still fascinated and could not deny the sheer power of her acting talent. And what also put Simone Signore on the map was that her husband was filming Let's Make Love with Marilyn Monroe during the time of Oscar voting. Speculations of an affair between the French star and Hollywood sex symbol were regularly plastered across the news and kept Simone Signore's name in the papers too. Now you're on the very pinnacle of fame as a film actress, of course you're gossiped about an enormous lot and I expect you sometimes find this as a persecution. Do you find it unpleasant to have your private life gossiped about in the press? Yes, sure. I Is do. it happening very much? Yes, lately, yes. Everyone involved denied an affair and the marriage between Simon Signore and Yves Montand lasted until her death in 1985, but she was completely aware of what was going on. Well, there was, see, I don't even know how far to pursue this, but there was more than the professional relationship there. Was there or am I completely wrong? No, it's what they say, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, well... Accompanying her husband to the US while he worked on the movie also gave Simone Signore the opportunity to actively campaign for the Oscar, and she herself said how for months she had nothing to do but sit around in Beverly Hills and shake hands. Which obviously paid off. However, Simone Signore's performance also spoke for itself in this Oscar race. She had the by far most praised performance of the year with awards from different critics groups and a Best Actress award in Cannes. She was a strong runner-up to Audrey Hepburn at the New York Film Critics Awards, where she received 7 votes compared to Audrey's 8, and most Oscar predictions were between those two, with some giving an outside chance to Elizabeth Taylor. Okay, but what do I think about Simon Signore's award-winning performance? Right ahead, I have to agree with critics back then that she easily walks away with Room at the Top, and exactly for the reasons that everyone pointed out. Her distinct French presence, which makes her so out of place in this very British surrounding and gives her character an additional sense of loneliness and distance, as well as her completely unconventional approach to this role. You remind me of a boy I used to know at the university in Paris. It must be funny being French. Here in Wuhan. No. It's not funny. Are you very unhappy, Alice? Not very. I mean, look at the performances that won Best Actress in the years before. All I want is my own name and a modest job to buy sugar for my coffee. Will you you can't it? believe that, can you? Ha! Listen to me, I'm laughing too! Ha <laughs> ha <laughs> 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 And now we have this. What to hell with you? Do you think our love is just like a layer of dirt that I can wash it off? I believe in our love. What else have I got? It's all I have to believe in. You ask me not to make it difficult. But I'm not like you, aunt in Dufton. Why shouldn't I make it difficult for you? Because it won't do you any good, that's why. I'm going to marry Susan. Don't say it again. Please don't say it again. This is not an exaggeration. This is the most dramatic acting of Simon Signore in Room at the Top. And it's also in no way meant dismissively of these other actresses, but just supposed to show how different her work is in comparison to almost every other performance in this category. While the character of Alice might have provided many opportunities to go big and at the expected outbursts and sense of despair, Simone Signore's performance is completely internal, creating a stark and unforgettable contrast between the passion of the character and her calm exterior. You stupid bitch, it isn't that at all! Don't you see, it's the idea of other people looking at your nakedness that I hate, it's not decent, don't you see? Oh, I understand now what makes men kill women like you. 
Oh, you're very brave and very moral all of a sudden. That's what you like, isn't it? Leg show and lingerie. It isn't decent for me to pose for an artist who sees me as an arrangement of light and color. But it's perfectly okay for you to kiss me all over and lie for an hour just looking at me. Elspeth isn't rich, you know. You need to drink all our gin. Give that to her and tell her I broke the bottle. To think I ever let you touch me. Now oh, listen. I own my own body and I'm not ashamed of it. And I'm not ashamed of anything I've ever done. Hardly any other performance in movie history so beautifully combines the words mature and erotic in one character. Alice can be a mentor, a guide, a companion, as well as a lover, but never in a forced way. I suppose you think I'm conceited. Young and terribly inexperienced, but not conceited. Well, if that's the way you really feel about her, then you must be right. Your trouble is you don't believe enough in yourself. I'll tell you something, Alice. I like you. I, I don't mean sex, I mean like you. I like to talk to you. I just like you. Rather, she accepts life as it comes towards her. She never actively tries to flirt with Joe, but simply fascinates him by her sheer magnetism which Simon Signore obviously has to offer in spades. Simone Signore is able to communicate a strong sense of self-worth in Alice, her intelligence and experience, as well as her sex appeal, without focusing on any of these aspects. Her cool, composed nature speaks for herself without needing any explanation or background. Here. You need a drink? No. You want me to drive you home? No. I'd like to go to Sparrow Hill. It's cold up there. That's what I want. It's all my cold and clean. With no people. No dirty people. Simone Signore also beautifully underlines the tragedies of Alice without making them the only aspect of her performance. Sadness and worry are clearly constant followers of Alice. Sadness for a state of life, worry that she cannot be able to hold Joe due to her age. But they never feel like Alice's only characteristics. Supposing you had met me when I was 10 years younger, would you have taken me seriously? You know I would. Imagine me as I was 10 years ago, and you as you are now. There were no lines then. Would you have loved me and wanted to marry me? Yes. But I'll tell you something. What? I like you the way you are now. Mm. You'd like me much more than I was your age. What did you do 50 years ago back in the Great War? You want some tea? I don't want anything. Still, Simon Signore sometimes does exaggerate the sadness of Alice a bit, even in her underplaying. Look, Alice, let me have the keys, will you? I've got to take the Citroen. Why? My ignition's gone, and I've got to get over to Leeds tonight. So late? Something cropped up unexpectedly. I'll be away a couple of days.
But uh, what about the car for tomorrow? What about it? You know I was going to take Elspeth to Manchester to the ballet. You know I arranged it weeks ago. Oh, well, you'll just have to make it some other time, won't you? Enjoy yourselves, everybody. Good night, Dan. So it is no surprise that Simone Signore always shines most in scenes that ask her to portray her depths of feelings, that constant sadness, that hesitation of joy and sexual maturity, and mostly focus on her face and her ability to fill her dialogue with experience and passion. Oh, uh, while well, I'm handing out advice, do you mind if I tell you about our last scene, the bedroom one? Oh, I know, I, I made a mock of it. You're not frightened of me, are you? No. Well, you must take hold of me as if you meant it. I'm not fragile, you know, I won't break. I'll try, Alice. Is it so difficult? Simone Signore also works perfectly in her relationship with co-star Lawrence Harvey. She's neither swept completely off her feet, nor does she treat this affair as just another romance that comes and goes, but you sense how, even if she constantly remains skeptical, she hopes that this connection will be different than what she has experienced so far. Yes, it was funny. <laughs> I didn't mean to snap at you. Oh, forget it. Will you come and have a coffee with me? No, but you may buy me a drink. Can you drive? Yes, oddly enough. Of course, I never owned a car, but I learned to drive in the RAF. Here. You're very touchy, aren't you? Where to? To the St. Clair. It's quiet. And Simone Signore also deserves praise simply for giving Alice so much depth and complexity despite the limitations of the script. Alice is neither a very large part, nor is she given any true characterization outside of her relationship with Joe. But Simone Signore is able to tell the entire story of her life with just a glance, a hesitation or an unspoken word. Alice, I hate to see you hurt. I'm not hurt. You sure you don't want me to take you home? I'd like to. I'd rather not. Still, even if Simone Signore does actively avoid giving a performance that is only out to gain the audience's sympathy, she certainly benefits from the way Alice is written as the character's misery is clearly laid out and presented to the viewers. But more than that, by creating such a stark aura of mystery in her role, Simone Signore is not quite as effective when she is asked for a stronger open reaction and involvement in the moment of the scene. I can just see you in Dufton now, looking at nudes in a magazine, drooling over them, saying you wouldn't mind having a quick bash. That's one of your words, isn't it? But blackguarding the girls, calling them shameless whores. Oh, shut up. You make a great to-do about your humble beginnings. But you've never really been hard, eh? You've never gone hungry. What do you think a POW gets to eat? Mmm. Even then you didn't starve. There's always been somebody to take care of our Joe. You got extra. You told me yourself. Because you got along so well with the guards. And even if she is able to go beyond the limits of the script, she cannot give reason to all the questions surrounding Alice. Why is she so obsessed with Joe? Why did her life end up the way it did? How did her marriage turn into the loveless relationship it is now? While the answers to these questions might not feel truly necessary, it would have been nice if her approach had somehow been more grounded and less lyrical, no matter how effective it may be. You've changed so much, Joe. You know that. So have you. Yes, I have no more defenses. How have I changed? Oh, I don't know how to say. You're, you're stronger now, more sure of yourself. Oh, I was so angry with you at first when you wanted Susan. <laughs> Seemed to want things for all the wrong reasons. 
but even with the slight criticism, this remains one of the most unique performances that we can ever see in this category. And it's fascinating to see Simon Sinray do so much with so little, and be so unique with something so unexceptional. There is something you have never understood, Joe. These people at the top, they are the same as anybody else. But you had it inside of you to be so much bigger than any of them. You just had to be yourself. That was all. With me, you were yourself. Only with me. Dites-moi, Simone Signoret, quelle est la réaction d'une actrice française qui reçoit un Oscar à Hollywood oh, C'est une... extraordinaire comme sensation, parce que tout, tout s'y mêle, la fierté personne, personnelle euh, et une reconnaissance éperdue à des gens qui donnent ça à un étranger, ce qui n'est plus le cas en Amérique. Ils ont été extraordinairement gentils. Ont... D'abord, ils ont été gentils tout le temps. Dès qu'on est arrivé, ils ont été gentils. Et pour Yves et pour moi, mais euh, ça a été une montée comme ça qui s'est couronnée par ce soir, on dirait une blague, enfin on dirait que c'est comme dans un mauvais scénario, je dis ça au soir, mais c'est vrai, un mauvais scénario, on raconte une histoire de compte de fait, en fait. So as always, this was a lot of talk, so let's get to my ranking of these five performances. I happen to like living alone. Look, I don't know what's bothering you, but don't take your bedroom problems out on me. I have no bedroom problems. There's nothing in my bedroom that bothers me. Oh, well, that's too bad. Well, Mr. Allen, let's try to be adult about this and, and work out some sort of schedule where I can make my business calls and you can make your... whatever you call the calls you make. Now... From the hour to the half hour, the phone will be yours. From the half hour to the hour, it will be mine. Should either of us receive a call during the other's half hour, he or she will terminate the conversation as quickly as possible. In emergencies, each will exercise a little tolerance. How does that sound? How about the Mediterranean in, in a garden? I took his arm. You took his arm, yes. It seemed like such a natural thing to do, but he pulled away. Oh, he must have loathed being touched by her. I only did it to try and show my appreciation for his kindness. I didn't want to... There was nothing else. Anyway, it was there in Amalfi. Suddenly, last summer, that he began to be restless and... Go on. He couldn't go on. Give me a cigarette, though. I have a feeling that this is all we're going to have. This is only the beginning. Mm. Please walk away now, darling. Go away, don't go back. Think of me. How odd. I hadn't thought about all that in years. Why should I suddenly... Yes, we saw those birds one summer in the Pacific. You see, my son Sebastian was looking for... Looking for what? Rare hungry birds. That isn't what you started to say, is it? You're too quick for me. No, I was going to say my son Sebastian was looking for God. But I stopped myself because I thought you'd think, what a pretentious young crackpot. Which Sebastian was not. This is something I've never told anyone before, something so strange, so terrible. Forgive me if I sound quite mad, but it's true all the same. Sebastian saw the face of God.
such a death happened with us, Mamaluk, we would tie the murderer to a stake and cut his body for fish bait. But we would not. We have been taught to forgive. <laughs> This is a year when the quality of the performances truly live up to the reputation of the performers. And even if Doris Day is not quite on the same level as her co-nominees, I am still glad that this nomination happened. In the end, my numbers 5, 4 and 3 were rather clear, but choosing between the two Hepburns was very difficult and it almost feels impossible to compare two so totally different performances. One with the goal to create as much personality as possible, and the other trying to suppress every bit of character to the point of completely disappearing. But in the end, I cannot deny the power of Audrey Hepburn's sister Luke and the miraculous dedication and thoughtfulness of her work. Still, I would never complain that a European powerhouse like Simon Signore was awarded with an Oscar when the Academy had the chance to do so. Like Anna Magnani, Simone Signore got a second nomination a couple of years later for another English language performance, but also like Anna Magnani, she did not start a Hollywood career but continued to work primarily in Europe. Which is maybe not surprising if you have to spend your post-Oscar time in the US with accusations of being a communist and columnists immediately calling you difficult to cast. Her win did also not cause a new wave of great parts for actresses of a certain age, as for example Barbara Stanwyck had hoped. But it does remind us that, occasionally, the Academy can surprise us with an Oscar win that escapes every pattern and rule and simply stands as a choice for acting excellence. Simone Signore, room at the top! Thank you so much. I wanted to be very dignified and all that. <clears throat> I can't. You can't imagine what it is for, for me being French. You can't imagine. Uh, and I want to thank Jimmy Wolf and Jack Clayson and Lawrence Harvey because it looks a little corny to say that, but you know that without them I would have never been here tonight. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> Thank you for watching, if you have any opinion on this Oscar race, want to tell me that I am completely wrong or that this video is far too long, please let me know below or on Twitter.